Hello everyone, my name is Pamela Nuri, Head of Expedition Operations at Nova Caledonia. We have with us here again today, Colin Baird, who's all the way over in BC, Canada, in Vancouver Island. And we're going to talk a little bit about a shared favorite itinerary or area of the world, which is Iceland. Hello, Colin, how are you? I'm very well, Pam, how are you? Very good, thanks. Now, Colin, you were, um, suckered into doing this interview because you've actually spent a fair bit of time in Iceland, not only with us on many wonderful voyages, but you lived there for a couple of months for a particularly interesting reason. Would you like to share that story? Uh, yes. Well, I, um, I originally moved uh, to uh, Iceland, to the Westman Islands, so to Himai, back in 2002 to um, take over a project uh, which was an attempt to release a captive orca back into the wild. So his name was Keiko, who had uh, realized some fame from a little movie called Free Willy that he was in. And so I was hired to go over and look after this orca. But in the course of my first summer there, he decided to swim across the Atlantic to Norway. So I had to move to Norway. So my time in Iceland was a little shorter than I had intended. I'd moved there for, you know, well, I didn't know how long, but was gone within a few months. So the rest of the project finished up in Norway. So 2002, a lot's changed in Iceland since then. I think it was uh, predominantly Eyjafjallajökull, the volcano that went off and disrupted all the air traffic in, I think, 2012, that really gave Iceland a lot more notoriety than it had before. And I understand tourism increased by, you know, 80% year on year after that volcano. Um, no such thing as bad publicity, shall we say. So would you say things have changed a lot in uh, your view since back then and what you see now? Oh, for, for sure. And, and you know, Iceland, like so many places in, uh, which rely heavily on tourism and the increase in tourism, that, you know, you need to be careful about the, the product of your own success. You know, can your infrastructure handle it? Do you have a and again, it's a short season. Okay, they do have a, some winter season with respect to the Aurora Borealis and uh, the Northern Lights and things like that. And so there is a winter tourism, but it's predominantly a, a summer tourism, uh, short season. Uh, so it's a lot busier than it used to be. And, and Iceland needs to sort of be careful they don't get too busy, in my opinion. Yeah, I think you're right. You get definitely get that sense I've been going as well um, almost every year since 2012, I guess. Um, or maybe a little bit before that. And yeah, you do notice um, the numbers just increasing, increasing, increasing. And it's not surprising because it has so much fantastic stuff to offer. Um, geologically, land, you know, geolo geologically unique, the landscapes are absolutely stunning. And it's this very, I want to say, safe wilderness experience. You know, there's not like um, too many crazy monsters and this and that that can go wrong. Um, it's quite safe as far as things go, but you get that magic of a wilderness exposure. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, an island nation with, you know, a lot of glaciers and ice, so everyone lives around the outside on the sea. So the whole, basically, interior of the country is wilderness. Um, you know, you see those massive uh, tired vehicles for going out into the middle of, you know, fjording uh, streams and so on, and their big snorkels on their trucks and so on. And, I mean, the whole place is a wilderness uh, haven, bonanza. Um, and that's why, the, you know, the Icelanders are so wonderful. They're so, such outdoorsy people. They're so connected to the nature and so on. And, uh, yeah, I, I just love Iceland. Uh, you, you're so right. There's something about uh, traveling around Iceland. It's more than, you know, there's the tick boxes, of course, um, the amazing volcanic scenery. Um, Namaskaj, um, Sulphur Fields, and um, sort of the big, you know, Vatna Yukul, um ice caps. And, you know, there's these sort of tick boxes that you want to see, the Golden Triangle. But it's uh, a lot of it touches you in a way that's hard to put your finger on. The people, as you say, they're so connected to the outdoors and to nature. They're very down to earth, sort of so friendly but uncomplicated you know it's very welcoming but not an overdo it kind of way you know yeah it's, well it's just one of those countries that i i've never ever felt unsafe uh in any situation uh, in nature or in you know a city um it's just not that sort of society 
Colin, I had just, as you said that, I just thought of this, uh, this funny memory. Um, when we were coming around the West Fjords last year there before, and this whopper of a storm, it just, it, it was bigger than what we thought. And it was coming down, it was sort of on our stern quarter, it was coming down from, you know, Greenland side. And you were out on deck and you were, I mean, it was really rough. People were, you know, staying in their cabins. It was the afternoon and it was incredibly rough for that sort of voyage. And you were sort of banging on the window, like, look, 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 but it was so rough out at sea. And I thought, Colin, like, honestly, if there's a whale out there, I'm not going to come and look and announce this whale for people to see. It's so rough, they're not going to see it. And you were like, banging, banging, banging. You were, look, 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 look. And eventually I saw what you were meaning, and there was an iceberg, like this massive iceberg that had come down from Greenland. Do you remember that? And I announced it on the PA, but I don't think people felt better about being in this massive storm and now seeing this massive iceberg. But it was just such an incredible sighting. So sorry, speaking of feeling unsafe in Iceland, that was one little thought, that was one little memory that just jumped to mind. That was pretty funny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to share the screen here for a second, uh, just to jump onto the map of Iceland so we can just talk through some of the highlights. Actually, um, let me quickly look at this one. This is one of the itineraries that we do. So a lot of the Iceland itineraries is almost a full circumnavigation of Iceland, but we also have these passage to Iceland types of itineraries where you start in Oban, you've got to do St. Kilda, obviously, if you're going that way, which is a huge, um, you know, pretty epic stopping point. Um, the Faroe Islands are absolutely incredible i've always thought we could do full itineraries just in the pharaohs um I, the only reason i don't think we do that is more because you know there's a lack of demand a lack of realization how amazing the pharaohs are but so there, there are these great stopovers and then of course we get to iceland and we start a pop and when you do it this way there's something so nice about arriving this way you're seeing the big bat ice cap on your arrival and that is why iceland got named iceland because actually it's really quite green and lush in the summer for the rest of the island but on arriving at that angle towards hop you see yeah. the big ice cap and that's how it sort of ended up getting its name yeah I mean, how would that have looked a thousand years ago i'm sure you know yeah for sure um yeah. so i'm going to move over to um one of our one of the other maps over here the um as you move around Iceland, we've got the big Vatnajökull ice cap, which you can see there on the map, and that's a pretty, pretty amazing experience. It's sort of a great way to start. You you, you have these tours right up in the ice cap, and you have the Glacier Lagoon tours as well. Um, and then if we move around uh, the map a little bit, we've got the little towns on the east side, Sæðarfjörður and Nøyfjörður and Eskapstadur. Um, all of the towns they are so. They're tiny, actually. There's only a few things going on in these towns. They're absolutely delightful. They're colorful. They're quaint. The people are, and you know, friendly, but in a very low-key kind of carry on about their day kind of way. You really just walk around and just feel so a part of a part of the area. It's very, very lovely. Those towns. Yeah, they are, especially on the east side, Sadie's and and uh, uh, Neskap tour. Yeah. Yeah, this is where we, this where we the ferry actually comes in, say this fjord um, from, in, is it Copenhagen? Yeah, that comes from uh, the Faroe Islands and Denmark, I believe, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the car so that's where that one comes in. And then mm -hmm. when we come around, we do sometimes do something at um, Torshofen, but generally the next stop then will be Husavik, which is the? Whale watching capital of Iceland. <laughs> yeah, and it's certainly one of the best places to see it, um, see whales in the world. We we have uh, the whale watching day that day. I mean, it's a lovely town in itself with the most amazing um, whale museum. But we generally have the whale watching out of Husavik that day, and it's it really is a terrific place globally speaking to see humpback whales. It, it is, and uh, we have had some luck with blues out there as well. There's some other things, but. Um... He, that that whale museum in Husavik is well worth mentioning, Pam. I know you did, but it is one of the, for a small town like that, it, that is one of the best um, whale museums you'll come across with all of those um, skeletons hanging from the ceiling and so on. It, it, it's a really well done uh, exhibit and um, well worth a visit. Yeah, I, I know uh, many of the marine mammal lecturers, yourself and myself included, you'll see pictures in their lectures or all around the world over the years, you're like, I know that photo was taken in that whale museum. It really is a terrific whale museum, you say. 
And worth yeah. a mention up here is this tiny little island, uh, Grimsey, which we go to. That is one of the beauties of being on a vessel. It's so easy to just pop up to this tiny little island up here, Grimsey. And that's where we cross the Arctic Circle. Um, and it's a lovely hike, a lovely birding day, puffins, all that kind of thing. And it's you know, accessible by ship, but it's quite an important route of passage to cross the Arctic Circle. Yeah, well, we, so we cross the Arctic Circle by ship on the way in, anchor, go ashore by Zodiac, and then we all walk across the Arctic Circle. You know, it takes a little while to get up to it, but, um, and it's a moving target, of course. So they've got a nice new feature there, which is that rolling ball. So they can move the, uh, the, the monument as the uh, Arctic Circle changes. And, you know, we see these Arctic Circle crossing um, monuments and markers all over the world. And they generally have, you know, a big sort of tower with a ball on top or something like that. And Iceland was the first one to have this very, very clever design of this big ball um, sphere that can be rolled. Because, I mean, the way the declination of the Earth is adjusting, it's moving north by about 12 meters a year currently, I think, at the moment. Um, so I think in a couple of years, it's going to roll that ball right into the sea. It's going to have to, yeah. <laughs> but it's a very clever design, so it's, that's quite a fun uh, part of the part of the journey. It and it, um, it's a beautiful day on Grimsey. I mean, um, yeah, it it's a low island, windswept, but loads of birds. It's a lovely walk. I, I I'm very happy to go into Grimsey every time. Now there's a couple of other national towns up in the north here. I won't even go into Akureyri and um, Siglufjord with the Hearing Ear Museum. There's some absolutely fantastic stuff up there. Um, but I wanted to pay a special bit of attention here to these um, West Fjords and this whole area around East of Fjord and the West Fjords. This is such an incredible wilderness area, much harder to get to by land because Iceland actually is quite friendly to do land tours. It's easy, easy to get around and there's a lot going on. But these West Fjords are harder to get to by land and stunning by sea. They are indeed. And, and Iceland, you know, they're, they're famous for the Ring Road which circles the country and a lot of vacationers will do it uh, camping or in caravans uh, uh, which is a great way to see the country but um, you know I always love traveling by ship because you get on board once you unpack once you go ashore all day long and see the things you want to see then you come back to the comforts of the ship and you do your traveling overnight while you're asleep and then you wake up the next day in a, another location and so on. So it's the ships are a really beautiful way to see the country. And again, accessing these West Fjords, as you mentioned, is just near, not impossible, but very difficult to do on your own. Yeah. And there's a lot of spots that you would miss um, on land, particularly some of the sea cliffs that you can see so spectacularly um, from the ship. Um, Hornstrander up in the north, Latrebjarg here on the western tip. Um, it's pretty special being able to access them. Sometimes we just access it, um, seeing it from the ship. And if conditions yeah. permit, I mean, you must appreciate these are very exposed to the whole of the sort of North Atlantic here. Um, and if you can approach it by Zodiac, you can get closer looks at some of these cliffs that are just absolutely amazing. Yeah, well, with apologies to any of my friends in the Azores, um, the... Icelandic claim is that the cliffs at Latrebjarg are the westernmost point of Europe. Uh, now, geologically, they're in North America because the fault that runs between the, the, the Atlantic Ocean runs right through the middle of Iceland. So geologically, it's um, North American, but politically, it's European. <laughs> okay. Well, you've, we've all been to this spot in Iceland where you can stand with one foot in North America and one foot in Europe, geologically yeah. speaking. Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, that's actually, I think that one's on the Golden Triangle, um, which we don't normally include in our day-to-day -day, um, voyages, because so Iceland is accessible, so many people go there, so that's something a lot of our guests would have done. So it often is just part of a pre-cruise or post-cruise extension, yeah. or people can do it themselves when they arrive. But it's worth a mention because you've obviously got the Blue Lagoon as part of that whole Reykjavik area day, which is, it's lovely, but it's not well, the I, only I'm lagoon. I'm sorry I don't have my pictures of you at the Blue Lagoon with mud all over your face to bring up. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, that's the famous one. But of course, there's other um, lagoons around Iceland. And in most towns, there's some sort of a hot spring pool that you can swim in. Sometimes it's done a bit like a indoor swimming pool 
kind of like a gym for the for the town obviously because winters and everything but other times it's just literally out in a field there's hot spring pools all over the show um, that people don't really know about and it's a bit of a treat for people that are more in the know which is which is a lovely feature of Iceland. Yeah well it's geologically I mean they've got so much geothermal uh, uh, energy there and that's why they produce so much aluminium because the power is essentially free. Yeah. So all, the, all the bauxite gets shipped up from Australia and they produce it in, in, in a very high quality in, in Iceland because the power is cheap. Yeah. You know, you mentioned that and I, it reminds me, I think there's always the tick boxes why people want to go and they want to see the geological scenery and the wilderness and th that's all there and you will see all those things and it's stunning and it's safe and it's, you know, it's absolutely magic. But I think what you really come away with is a sense that Iceland's on the up and up. They're living in the future. They're entirely uh, based their economy on no fossil fuels, all geothermal and renewable energy, hydro energy as well. Um, and things are just moving forward there in a very healthy way connected to nature and their natural resources. Uh, things are such a huge focus on sustainability and you just get this very a big sense that Iceland is one to watch. Iceland is one to model a lot of our economies on. They're doing things right. They're getting it. They're achieving success in areas where the rest of the world, some are lagging more than others. And you just really get this good sense, a good feeling of good things happening there. Yeah. You no, know, it's a very progressive country. They always have been. Um, they've been isolated for many generations, of course, but less and less. But it's, it's a place that I think was just as a tour, a travel destination was just off a lot of people's radars for the last few decades. Um, you know, North Americans, we go to Europe. Uh, you know, Europeans, they come to North America, they head to South America, they go to Africa, Europe, you know, or Asia. Um, but it's a wonderful place. And, and Air Iceland does a lot of stopovers. You can, you know, if you're traveling from North America or from Europe to North America, you can stop in Iceland for three or four days, no, no problem. And, yeah. No, they're really, you know, they had their financial troubles a few years ago, but um, they, they've come, come right with that, I think. Yeah. Colin, thanks so much. Um, I'm looking forward to our next trip to Iceland, and I hope we see a lot more of our, our guests on our Iceland itineraries. It's nice and easy to go there um, from the UK as well. It's not too onerous of a journey. Um, which, no, and, which it's a good, and it's a good destination for whales. <laughs> yeah, it really is actually one of the best. So thanks yeah. so much for your time, Colin. It's been great chatting and I look forward great to seeing to talk you. To you Pam. See you out there again soon. Okay, take care. Thanks. Cheers, Colin. Bye. Bye.